right, good morning. Uh, today we're going to be talking about schematics. Uh, so if you're not familiar with schematics, uh, the best way to kind of get us started here is to think about the Angular CLI, right? So when we're using the CLI today and we generate out a new project, or perhaps we generate out a component or a service, we're using schematics, right? So the CLI takes advantage of schematics in order to generate files and also to modify files, right? So think about when you generate out a component. Not only does it stub out the files for you, but also will go and find the nearest module, and then it declares that a component inside that module for you. And so that is kind of what schematics uh, can do in the CLI today. Yeah, and generating code is really one of the big reasons I'm here because I don't know about you, but I can't stand repeating myself doing the same setup logic over and over again. And so one of the things I found myself doing was setting up Prettier with Angular time and time again. And for those that don't know, Prettier is an opinionated code formatter. And I kept going to the same blog post by Aaron Frost. He has a great Medium post with 10 steps, and I'd set them all up, and sometimes I'd miss one, sometimes I'd get it right. Um, and I had just written a schematic for Jess, and I thought, this is a perfect example. Let me write a schematic that sets up Prettier with Angular and does all the steps for me correctly. Uh, and that's how I got started. Cool. So why don't we start with the definition Oh, we're going to start with a quick intro on what we're going to talk about. So first, we are going to talk about how you can add files using schematics. And then we're going to talk about updating files. And you're going to see that that's a little bit more complicated than it is to add files. Right. Then we'll look at extending schematics. So there's a lot of great schematics that are already written. And we can leverage those within our own. Then we'll look at some of the lessons we've learned on how to speed up development. Uh, and finally, talk about a couple use cases. All right, cool. And so now let's, let's start, get to that definition. Yeah, definition first. So one of the definitions we've come up with is that a schematic is a collection of executable tasks that can generate and or modify code deterministically. And so there's a couple key things we'd like to break down there. Right, so a collection. So schematics consist of multiple tasks, right? So when you install a schematic, whether that's um, like Angular Material, you're gonna have multiple tasks that you can execute within that schematic. So it's a collection. And then executable may, well, we jumped really far ahead. <laughs> Let's use that. Yeah. Um, there you go. So schematics are executable. This may seem obvious, uh, but it's important to remember that we're going to be executing these in the context of the Angular CLI or perhaps the schematic CLI. Right, and like we talked about, schematics can generate or modify code. So we're going to be writing code that's going to be creating code for us. And lastly, we say that they're deterministic because with the schematics engine, we have access to an abstract syntax tree, which we'll talk about later. But this lets us write very precise code, and we're not just dealing with uh, string matching or regular expressions. Yeah, I don't want to write a bunch of regular expressions to generate code. Me either. OK, so how do we get started with schematics? So the first thing you need to do to get started with schematics is you actually need to install an additional CLI. So this is not the Angular CLI that you're already using today, but there's a schematic CLI. So you can use NPM or Yarn and install that globally. And that comes out of the Angular Dev Kit. After you install that, you've got the schematics executable that you can execute. In this example, we're going to create a new project. So similarly to ng-new for an Angular project, with schematics, you can use schematics blank followed by the name of the project. And just like our TypeScript or Angular files, we're going to compile it with the build command, and then we'll execute it with the schematics executable. So here we'll call schematics. Uh, we'll specify the path, so in this case a dot, followed by a colon, the name of the schematic, and then any options that it may have. All right, cool. Let's do a quick demo. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to take a look at two schematics uh, that Brian and I have both written. We'll take a look at Brian's first here. Uh, and we're going to run these um, with the ng command followed by generate and then the name of the schematic. Cool. So you can see here that Kevin's getting prompted here for the name of the component. And one of the things that I found myself doing repetitively was dealing with unsubscribing from observables, right? And there's a couple different approaches to do that. We can have a subscription. We can add uh, child subscriptions onto that. We can use ward subsync. Um, and another option is to use the take until operator. And so I was finding myself kind of repeating this same code uh, continually in my Angular applications. I've got to import the subject. I've got to import take until. 
I've got to implement the on destroy interface, uh, declare my subject, and then in the ng on destroy, I've got to go ahead and next on that subject and then complete it. And I was doing this over and over and over again, and I was like, man, this is crazy. Why don't I just write a schematic so that way I can generate out like maybe a smart component, if you will, right? And so that's what, I, that's what we did. Very cool. All right, next let's take a look. Um, let me clear this out. And uh, we'll take a quick look at the uh, prettier schematic that I wrote. So I'm going to select all the defaults here that set all this up. And we'll let it just stop there and take a quick look. So here's an example of some of the things that I kept having to do. I'd have to go to my package JSON, set up a pre-commit hook, run lint stage, all these things. These are relatively easy. We could probably all do these very quickly, um, but it's trivial and sometimes I'd miss a step and I'd always have to go back to this article. And now I can do this within a matter of seconds and share it out with uh, everyone else. Very cool. So now let's talk about adding files uh, and kind of get into this a little bit more. So when we're adding files, we've got this ability to kind of create templates. So think about our templates that we create in Angular today, right? So the syntax is a little bit different than Angular though. Rather than using like double curly braces to do like string interpolation, there's this kind of PHP kind of ASP style syntax with brackets, right? So you're gonna do a less than percent equals and then the name of the variable. In this case, that variable is name. And then right there is where our uh, schematic is going to replace with whatever that value was that either the user was prompted, perhaps, uh, or they provided on the command line, or maybe that was calculated or computed inside your code of your schematic. And then we'll take a little look at a little more in-depth example. So this is an excerpt from the uh, Angular component uh, schematic. Uh, and here we are interpolating the selector and style extensions uh, variables uh, inside of our template file. The other thing we can do when we're generating out uh, files using schematics is we can use logical operators, right? So here's another example. This comes uh, from the CLI. So when we're generating out a component, we can say, hey, if I want to do inline styles, let's go ahead and just add that styles property in my component metadata. Otherwise, let's add the styles URLs. And lastly, we don't have to put all this logic in our template. Just like with our Angular code, we can extract some of these methods back to our TypeScript uh, files. Uh, and we have access to a lot of great methods out there. Uh, for example, such as manipulating strings to either dasherize them or classify them, depending on where we're using them. Okay. So we've talked about adding files, and it's relatively easy, right? We're just going to create some templates. We could put some string variables in there, string interpolation in there. We've got logical operators. We can execute functions. So we're off to a good start with adding files. Uh, so now let's take a little uh, kind of turn here, and let's talk about updating files. So updating files, it's super simple, Kevin. All we have to do is, in this case, I want to modify the environments file, right? So I'm going to add a package, or I'm going to add a configuration into my project, into the environments file. I'm just going to go out, I'm going to grab those top level nodes, I'm going to iterate over those, I'm going to find an opening brace indicator, I'm going to find that closing brace, I'm going to shove some code in there and we're done. Yeah, simple as that, right? And the first time I saw that, I was kind of lost. Like, what are nodes? What is, what is all this, you know, what are we talking about here? Um, and this is where you're going to, if you're writing schematics, this is your first introduction to an abstract syntax tree. And it's important to know you don't need to be an expert about it, uh, but you do need to understand what it is so that you can leverage it. Yeah, so an AST is kind of this structure of your code, right? So, and you get this out of the box. It's not like this is something that we're writing, right? We're not writing, so yep. TypeScript provides the ability to say, hey, go and read this TypeScript file and give me the abstract syntax tree for it. And then using that abstract syntax tree, we can programmatically go through the code in our code, right, and find an exact place where we want to insert something. So think again about the Angular CLI. When I'm adding, a, generating out a component, I've got to go find that nearest module. But then if you remember, not only does it import the component for you up at the top of the file, but there's also the declarations array. Now, yeah, maybe we could write some regex so we could say, let's try to find this declaration string and this opening brace or uh, bracket, mm -hmm. and then let's try to stuff it in here. But that gets really kind of messy, and you don't want to do that. And so with abstract syntax trees, we can logically 
find exactly where we want to insert code or update code or remove code from an existing file in our code base. Great. So let's take a look at how we would use that back in our previous example. Um, and real quick, uh, this is a really exciting slide. This is an example of what the AST kind of visually looks like. This is a great resource called uh, astexplorer.net. You can put in uh, any code in there uh, and choose the type of AST you want to look at, and this will give you a visual breakdown of how the abstract syntax tree represents that uh, code. And so here you can see we can get very precise on identifiers and brackets and methods and anything you'd ever want to need uh, to find exactly the, the line of code you're looking for. One of the ways I think about abstract syntax trees is like the DOM, right? So we know that the DOM is basically a giant tree-like structure, right? Starts with the body and we've got all of our sibling elements and child elements and grandchild in there on down, right? So you can kind of think about the abstract syntax tree in this kind of same structure. And we can iterate through it, we can find exactly the element, or not the element, that would be in the DOM, we can find the exact position in the code where we want to make our modification. And so we're, now we're back to our previous example. So in the first, uh, before we switched off, uh, we were looking at getting the position. So now that we have the position, uh, we can see we, uh, uh, access our method here called begin update. Uh, we uh, in input our starting position, we add our insertion, and then we commit our update. And it's also important to note here that the tree and schematics allows us to make changes in a sort of transactional way. And so we don't have to add any sort of undo logic to our schematic so that if something happens along the way, we don't have to back out that logic uh, and fix it. Yeah, and that's really important because we don't want to start mucking with the file system and then halfway down we've got some sort of problem and then we've got to deal with getting back out of what we did. Nope. So that is one of the uh, really great advantages of using schematics to generate code and to modify code in your Angular projects. Oop, it double. Sorry about that. Okay, so then let's quickly talk about extending schematics. So using schematics, we've talked about adding files. We've talked about removing files or, or modifying files, excuse me. But we can also use schematics to run external schematics. So let's say I'm uh, gonna write a schematic that maybe is going to install Angular material, right? So what we can do is we can use this function called external schematic. The first argument into this function is the package name. So in this instance, I'm gonna say, let's go ahead and run Angular material. And then within that collection, we're gonna run the ng add schematic. So we're gonna add the Angular material library into our project. The third argument are the options. So just like the options that you might get prompted for if you're using Angular material on the command line, or you might specify when you actually run ng add, we can uh, specify those options when we're running an external schematic. And there's also this other little thing called a no op function. And all we're doing here is we're basically saying, hey, if the user wants to install Angular material, let's go ahead and do that for them. But if they don't, let's just not do anything. And when you start writing schematics, it's, you'll quickly find that uh, there can be a lot to do, a lot to figure out, a lot to learn. Uh, but it's important to know that a lot of these problems that you may be encountering have already been solved. And so uh, we can leverage a lot of great uh, schematic repositories like the CLI, Material, uh, NGRX. Uh, and at this point, it's really okay to copy and attribute. So uh, you probably don't want to write the logic that says find the closest module and no add it to way. the declaration, right? That problem's been solved. Um, so it's okay to find that code and bring it into your schematic application. And we've done that a lot in our schematics. So it's, it's good to, when you're kind of learning about schematics, you might want to start looking at some of these projects and saying, well, how did they do this? How did they solve this particular problem? You know, I'm trying to do something maybe similar uh, in my code base. And so uh, I like to always go in and look at the source code in the CLI, Angular Material, and NGRX, kind of see how they did things, um, and then sometimes grab some of those utility functions that they have and bring them into my own project. Yeah, great idea. All right, so when we started writing our schematics, we ran into a problem of how do we get a quick feedback cycle or a quick feedback loop when we're developing these things. We're writing this schematic code and it's maybe it's running to the terminal, but I, I want to see it. I want that ng serve experience, right? And uh, what I really wanted uh, was something like this, where I could run a schematic and visually see what happened. What was the diff? How did it change from the initial state to the next state? 
And so we put together uh, a lot of great ideas that were already out there um, and put some scripts together and came up with this idea of a sandbox. And this allows us to execute our schematic against a version controlled application and then quickly see how it changed and then reset it and run it all over again. And it's running inside the context of the CLI. We're not using the schematic CLI anymore. Correct, correct. So let's take a look at how we did that. So it's pretty simple. We're just gonna ng new up a, an application. In this instance, we're gonna call it a sandbox. And that's all gonna live inside of a, what, when you generate out that blank, remember we talked about the schematic CLI and the blank command? So after we generate out a blank schematics project, we just throw in an Angular project right inside of there as well. We version control that so that way we can get that diffing between each run of our schematic. Uh, and then we're gonna use the TypeScript compiler. So we're gonna write our schematics using TypeScript. And then to execute them, we need to compile them down using TSC. And then through the magic of NPM linking, we can link in our schematic into our sandbox so that way we can execute it in the context of the Angular CLI. Yep. Once we have all that linking in place, uh, then we can add one or two scripts that will essentially CD into the sandbox, execute the schematic uh, just like you would with the CLI. Uh, and then if you choose so, you can run any sort of test to assert that you know, everything's working and nothing's broke. So you can run a lint, a test, and a prod build. So finally, let's talk about some use cases of schematics. I think we've, we, we know that the CLI uses schematics and is very useful for us uh, in, our, in our jobs as Angular developers, but why would I actually want to write my own schematic, right? And so one of the reasons why uh, I like writing schematics is that I can scaffold out code really, really quickly. So if there's something that uh, maybe I'm doing repetitively or, or like we mentioned with installing Prettier, I can scaffold out code really, really fast and I can write it once and then be done. Yeah, and third-party dependencies. This is one of my favorite ones because I find myself doing the same thing over and over again, uh, and this is my opportunity to help every, the community uh, and set this up once uh, for everyone to, and they can benefit from it as well. Yeah, right, like installing Prettier or Jest or maybe Angular Fire or whatever it is. Right? Exactly. So we can go out there and we can start writing schematics for the entire community to make it easier to install and use third-party third dependencies. Mm -hmm. Uh, the other use case might be just straight trivial stuff, you know, things that you're doing over and over and over again. Uh, and so it just makes it easy to just write it once and then you can generate it out uh, every time you need it. Yeah, and if you're part of a larger, larger organization, uh, consistency may be important. Uh, so if you have a, spe a specific pattern uh, that you want to help enforce, uh, Schematic may help you do that. Yeah, exactly. So uh, maybe there's an architecture that your organization uses uh, or, or, or that pattern like you mentioned, Kevin. Um, and we can write a schematic and say, hey, every time you need to do this, just go ahead and run that schematic. Uh, so instead of copy pasting between projects and, and kind of opening up one repo and say, oh, I gotta grab that code from here and bring it over there, we can use schematics and we can just have a schematic that will generate out that architecture, that, uh, that consistent code for us every time. Yep. With that, thank you very much. And uh, we'll be up here if you have any questions. Oh, wait, 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 one more thing. Yes. We got a workshop in a half hour. We do. So if this sounds exciting to you and you're like, wow, this is really neat, but how do we actually like get into it and build a schematic? Uh, join us over in the Grand Ballroom AD and for an hour, you get to hang out with Kevin and I and we're gonna actually install the schematic CLI. We're gonna uh, create a bl blank project and then we're gonna use that sandbox approach and we're gonna actually write some schematics together. So it'll be a lot of fun. Thank you. All right, everybody, give it up.